I came across this really interesting article from Andre Orlov, and the title is Leviathan's Not the High Priest Sash as a Cosmological Symbol. And essentially, in Josephus, in his uh, Jewish Antiquities, specifically 3154 through 156, he gives an interesting description of the high priest's sash. He says, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but specifically he's, he's speaking about, again, the sash. He says, which is of a breadth of about four fingers. Um, I think I moved this over. Sorry, my bad. So in an open texture, giving it the appearance of a serpent's skin which is really interesting. Now he's going to make another interesting point here, but before that, several scholars have drawn attention to the unusual features associated with the sacerdotal girdle. Uh, Fletcher Lewis, for example, notices several peculiar details in this description, including the comparison of the sash with the skin of the serpent and the language of twisting, further supporting serpentine symbolism. Analyzing these features, he concludes that the language is reminiscent of that used of the twisting serpent in Isaiah 27, 1 through 2, and the parallel passage in the bell cycle, where, as we have seen, there's a reference to an ephod. Uh, I think this is referencing another, I, I think this is a collection of articles, but obviously we, we didn't read that part about the ephod. He also draws attention to another description of the sash in Antiquities 3185, in which Josephus again offers a novel interpretation of the priestly sash, though this time comparing it to the ocean, uh, which encompasses the earth. So, and I had to, I had to uh, consult my my personal um, translation of antiquities because I was like, what, what is he talking about here? This is the uh, basically the mine translates translates it as the the breastplate and the ephod, right? So he's talking about that midsection is uh, after the manner of the earth, which occupies the midmost place, basically the chest, and by the girdle wherewith he encompassed it, he signified the ocean, which holds the whole in its uh, embrace. So point is, the breastplate area is the uh, is the earth, like it symbolizes the earth with the colors and things like that. And then you have the, the sash, which goes around it, it signifies the ocean. So continuing on, in light of the sash's associations with the serpent's skin and with the watery substance, the sea, the ocean, whatever, in which some mythological traditions was understood to be the traditional domain of the sea monster, Fletcher Lewis suggests that the sacerdotal sash might represent the defeated Leviathan. He also posits that Josephus in, in his passage likens the high priest to a divine warrior who defeats the sea monster, the sash here symbolizing victory over chaotic forces. Fletcher Lewis finishes his examination by noting the possibility that the high priest wears a vanquished leviathan. The sash hanging at his side evokes the image of a limp and defeated serpent in the hand of its conqueror. Um, specifically, that th this idea of the divine warrior is is really interesting because this is Exodus 15. Like that's kind of one of the typical passages brought up in the divine warrior motif, and. Exodus 15 obviously follows 14, and 14 is the crossing of the Red Sea. Again, the sea, the sea is split, and you get this, this, um, th this like conjunction of language of the, uh, of the crossing of the sea, the defeat of basically the, the defeat of the gods of Egypt kind of idea, the Exodus. You get a lot of that language that also echoes creation language in places like Psalm 74, Psalm 89, things like that, where you have you kind of have this. Um, this overlapping imagery and symbolism between the two different stories. But it's very interesting that, you know, this really does tie everything together because you do have the water, the watery chaotic forces in the crossing of the Red Sea. And it's right after that, that they go into the song of uh, Moses, that, you know, Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. And who is like Yahweh among the gods, things like that. So it, it's just very interesting because it really does fit very nicely with this uh, motif now continuing on he's basically seen other scholars have essentially uh, agreed with Fletcher Lewis here he continues on like uh, Fletcher Lewis's research these studies also attempt to interpret Josephus's description of the sash through the lens of the divine warrior motif Margaret Barker extends the use of this interpretive framework to her analysis of Christian developments such as the motif of the defeated waters found in the book of Revelation if you've ever read Heiser stuff, specifically his his um his pre-draft of Unseen Realm, it was called The Myth That Is True, because in that that particular version of the book, 
he begins with all of this this chaos chaos kampf motif and the end of it he actually ends up with this quotation of revelation 21 1 where he says i looked out and there's no more sea so she brings up that passage as well as the vision of the risen lord when he is described as the heavenly high priest wearing a long robe with a golden girdle around his breast and then the uh she's going to continue on she basically quotes what we just read above with the serpent um the, the serpent texture as well as the uh you know the color the the evocation of the um of the rope looking like the ocean or being reminiscent of the ocean but th- this is actually something that's interesting because i when i first read that the first thing though i thought i did think of this revelation passage but i i was like yeah, it, i'm not sure that works because it's golden in revelation there's at least two things that are worth mentioning though because they actually mention it in this article that one josephus gives kind of an extra biblical um description where basically this isn't in the bible but he says that the high priests at least in his time had uh, there was some gold that was actually woven into their sash uniquely the high priest so they had a little bit of gold in it um and then another aspect is when speaking of leviathans um Levine is often spoken of with like luminosity terms, uh, kind of these divine terms. And so he he is actually described as golden in some passages. Um, so this would actually fit quite well with the the image of a defeated Leviathan. So if that if this holds that that's what's going on with the the sash in the high priest, like if, if that's the symbolism that it it symbolizes the ocean and, and the the calm you know, chaotic forces um, by the sovereign God, then Jesus wearing the, the golden sash in Revelation would be that, like, kind of the greater symbolism of, of like, the cosmological version of that where where uh, Christ has now conquered the, uh, basically, Leviathan and all of the chaotic forces are brought under his dominion, that kind of thing. So, anyway, I, I just thought it was really interesting. But this is only page three of 23, um, there's a lot more that this goes into, and uh, there's um, they spend a lot of time in this article going over the kind of the tripartite divisions and the the microcosm macrocosm kind of thing going on with the with the way that the temple is set up because a lot of these symbols um, really kind of feedback on each other and inform each other, and so they they set up a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, which th- this is actually one of my favorite topics, maybe my favorite topic that I could spend hours going through. So f- for the sake of not reading the entire article and uh, not making this a one hour long video, which I could easily do, um, I'm just going to draw it to a close here. But um, I just thought that was interesting. I, I never actually read that that particular passage from Josephus where he, um, he seems to... Uh, pretty clearly speak of the sash of the high priest as being a defeated Leviathan. And that, that has some interesting Im- implications for like some of the Christological themes in uh, Revelation. But anyway, uh, that's about all.